MOT testing stations come in all shapes and sizes, from huge multi-franchise dealerships to garages with a single bay that offer MOT tests, but no services or repairs. MOT testing facilities also vary considerably. The size and layout of the bay depends primarily on the classes of vehicles being tested and on whether the underside inspection facility is a hoist or a pit. Another major influence are the conditions of appointment or the requirements of authorisation, as they're now called, that were relevant when the site was originally approved. These requirements have remained fundamentally unchanged since 1986, but they're now being amended to make them less onerous for all classes. And Jake Fawcett here from VOSA. Hi, Jake. Hi, Sophie. It's going to explain to us the important positive implications for test stations. Isn't that right? You know, you're dead right about the positive implications, especially for stations that uh, perhaps want to upgrade to one-person testing or even take on additional testing classes. Will all test stations be affected? Well, it's fair to say that the implications won't have as great an effect on motorcycle testing stations as they will, say, um, a Class 4 station. But uh, some of the changes will affect all testing stations, and they'll be free to choose whether to adopt them or not. Just tell us, Jake, before we talk about the actual changes themselves, what prompted VOSA to review the requirements now? Right, well, partly for simplification. Uh, many people believe that the uh, original requirements were confusing and ambiguous. Sounds like a pretty good reason in itself, Jake. Were there any other factors affecting that decision? Well, yeah, there were. Following the introduction of one-person test lanes and automated test lanes, many of the authorised examiners wanted to take advantage of, the, of this new equipment, but they couldn't do so because their premises wouldn't meet the existing requirements for authorisation. Because of dimensional requirements? That's right. Many VTSs were approved with earlier, less demanding requirements. Of course, many of these have been re-approved since then under what's commonly known as grandfather rights. And as a result, testing has been allowed to continue at those sites, much like this one here that we're visiting today. So we're we going to be looking at requirements for authorisation for new testing stations? Oh, not at all. We're going to be focusing on the changes that affect existing sites. However, it may also affect uh, multi-site authorised examiners as well if they have smaller premises which they already own that they couldn't get authorised under the existing requirements but find that they can authorise them under the new requirements. OK. Now, you mentioned earlier that uh, some of these changes would affect all test stations. Well, they may do, but let's have a look at this testing station here and we'll go through it. OK. Right, so here we are. This is one of the first changes that the uh, MOT stations are going to notice. Right. Is that they're no longer going to be required to have designated MOT parking bays. Really? No parking for the VE then? Oh, hi, hi. Uh, no, you're quite right. Um, I prefer to sneak up on those massive athletes and park outside of the street. But joking apart, you know, that's, that's one of the things that's going to change. So no parking requirements at all? Well, now, all we're asking MOT stations to do now is to provide adequate parking for customers, and, of course, that will be dependent on how much space they've got and the size of the business. Well, that sounds logical, because if there's nowhere for them to park, then they're not really going to attract many customers, are they? What no. else? Some MOT stations will have had to provide barriers and such likes to separate the MOT testing bays from the other activities in the garage. OK, and what's the thinking about that? Is that to prevent distraction? Exactly right, yeah. So what we're doing now is, rather than st stipulating that you've got to have barriers, we're going to leave it up to the authorised examiner to make the decision for themselves based on how their business is run and the proximity of other activities in the garage. So we'll leave it up to the AE to decide. And I guess there's health and safety considerations there as well. That's true. So one of the changes that's going to be introduced is that the presenter uh, or vehicle owner will be able to view the test via cameras positioned in the MOT testing bay so they can watch the test from the comfort of the waiting area on a TV monitor or um, a TV of some kind. OK. Are there going to be requirements surrounding that then? Well, there will be. One thing that we won't allow is uh, recording equipment to be used. So no action replays of the test then? No, I'm afraid not. There are very strict guidelines regarding the use of recording equipment. Um, and of course, it would overcomplicate the, the test process and we don't want to give the authorised examiners any additional burden of uh, extra cost. And I guess they might also feel a bit like Big Brother is watching them if it's all yeah. being recorded. Yeah, it probably would, yeah. So we, we, we don't want to add that pressure to the job. So how good should the picture quality be? Well, to be fair, we've deliberately avoided the issue of picture quality so as not to overcomplicate the issue. However, the image should be good enough so that the presenter or the person bringing the car to the test station 
can view all aspects of the test in reasonable comfort and it should be good enough so that they can see that um, all aspects of the test being carried out. So would you need more than one camera for that then? Well not necessarily because if, if there's one camera so positioned that the uh, presenter can view all aspects of the test uh, as they would do from a normal viewing area in, in the designated test bay then that would be okay but however if the AE thinks it's necessary to have two or more cameras that's entirely up to them. Are there any other changes that are going to affect all testing stations? Whilst the dimensional changes will primarily affect all classes, uh, it'll be mainly new stations rather than existing ones that they'll affect. OK, so if uh, you've got a testing station and you want to install the MOT viewing cameras or get rid of parking bays mm -hmm. or barriers, do you have to notify VOSA? First of all, because barriers and parking areas are no longer going to be a requirement, you won't need to let us know about that. But in respect of the viewing cameras, um, yes, they will have to let us know because we'll need to go along and check that they're fit for purpose. And I imagine there's a form, is there, that they'll need to fill in to get that, to get the wheels in motion? <laughs> oh, yes. What well, they'll have to complete a VT1 form, then relevant sections will be A1, A2, A8 and Section C. OK. Uh, and once you fill that in, uh, send it off to our local area office and um, that'll get the wheels in motion. So you've got to fill in a VT1 form, yes. only certain parts of it. Ha Should only take a few Should moments. Should only take a few minutes, that's right. That form available online? It is, on the Business Link website. You can download a copy, fill in the relevant sections and post it off to our, the, the local area office, the VOSA local area office. So what are the dimensional changes in the new requirements that might help a testing station upgrade to one-person testing? Well, some of the important dimensional requirements have been relaxed in the test area, along with some other requirements as well. So, why don't we go into a test bay and have a look? Let's do it. Let's go. Right, so here we are. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about the dimensions more specifically later on, but as you can see, this garage here has been, was authorised before 1986. So it's actually operating on the grandfather right, and we can see that clearly by the fact that the roller brake tester is so close to the doorway. Under the current regs, there would have to be a, a distance of four and a half metres between the roller brake tester and the door threshold. So under current regulations, basically, these guys wouldn't be able to upgrade to one-person testing simply because of that lack of space. That's true, but we could get round that by extending the building outwards, but of course that's a, clearly a very expensive option. Yeah, expensive, and you know, also they may not have the space, or it might just be very difficult to get planning permission. Well, that's true. However, under the new regulations, there may be possibility of them upgrading to, to one-person testing. However, there may still be a bit of work involved. Light replacing equipment? Possibly so. For a start off, they would need a lift with wheel play detectors fitted. Couldn't they just be fitted to the existing hoist, though? Well, it is possible, but in real terms, it's probably very unlikely. But in all cases, we will need written confirmation from the hoist manufacturer that the hoist is suitable for the fitment of wheel play detectors. And another thing to bear in mind is, of course, is that the hoist, the original hoist, might not be long enough to accommodate the extra length that's going to be required for the fitment of wheel play detectors anyway. But if the hoist needs to be longer, wouldn't that mean moving other equipment out of the way? Possibly so, but that'll depend on the, the, the layout of the, of the test facility anyway. But we'll look at the dimensional changes a bit later. Now, you mentioned the possibility of adding other test classes. I did, and it's possible that the relaxation of certain dimensions may allow test stations to take on other classes. For instance, uh, a Class 7 testing station may now be able to test Class 4 vehicles without any modifications at all. And what about vice versa? Will Class 4 be able to do Class 7? Well, that's possible, but headroom and doorway width will be a defining factor here. But it's much more likely under the new requirements than it was under the old ones. And another thing worthy of note is as well, that if you have the, the opportunity to test at Class 7, you will also have the opportunity to apply to be able to test Class 5 lightweights as well, uh, should you want to. OK, and what about Class 4s taking on motorcycle testing? Could that happen now, particularly uh, if they've already had the staff there who have the relevant expertise? Well, that's a possibility as well, of course, especially as how some of the automated test lane brake testers have the ability to be able to weigh motorcycles and brake test them as well. What if they have plate brake testers, though? Well, it's the same again, really. Some plate brake testers are suitable for testing motorcycles, uh, Class 3, Class 4 and Class 7 vehicles, provided they have the correct software fitted. So do decelerometers come into this? Yeah, they do. Now, if a VTS wants to take on the additional classes of testing motorcycles, they must have a suitable decelerometer. However, some decelerometers uh, are suitable for testing all classes of vehicles, so they would only need one. 
What about existing motorcycle test stations then? Do they need to have a decelerometer? No, they don't. Only new applicants for testing motorcycle classes will have to have a suitable decelerometer. Existing class one and two stations, it remains optional. So is that all that's necessary then for a class four testing station to start testing motorcycles? Not quite. An ATL roller brake tester or a suitable plate brake tester would take care of the, of the weighing equipment. However, they will still have to provide a suitable area for carrying out the motorcycle inspection. Okay, so say you've got a class four testing station and you don't want to increase the number of classes you test there, but you do want to increase the number of tests you do. Could you have, for example, two hoists and just one roller brake tester? Yeah, no reason why you can't have two hoists and just one headlamp tester, one roller brake tester, one gas analyzer and one smoke meter. As long as they're side by side? Well, they don't have to be side by side, just as long as they're positioned so that testing can be carried out effectively. Fair enough. So what's next? Right, now I think it's time we need to talk about uh, the dimensions. And to help us with that, I've got some illustrations set up on the laptop. So should we go and have a look? Yeah, great. Right. After you. Great. Yeah, sure. You. So we're going to be looking at all classes here then? Well, although there are dimensional changes for class one and two, uh, they're unlikely to affect existing layouts. So what we'll do is we'll concentrate on the dimensional changes that are likely to benefit existing stations, but these will mainly be class fours. Okay, so just uh, tell us what uh, you're going to show us here on your computer then. Right, well what we've got here is a typical plan layout of a grandfather rights authorised station, and as you can see the dimensions here are 9 metres long by 3.6 metres wide. And that is insufficient for them to upgrade to one-person testing under the previous requirements, is that right? That's right, but due to the dimensional changes in the new requirements, this may now be possible. So show us how that would work. Okay. In this example, we have a minimum length recess lift, and you can see that the roller brake tester is also very close to the entrance door. But to change to one-person testing, wouldn't the hoist need to be longer? Well, actually, there's no requirement for the hoist to be longer than the minimum 3.9 metres. However, in reality, it's unlikely that you're going to be able to accommodate any wheel play detectors on a lift of that dimension. So, what we're going to do here is we're going to use an example of a lift 4.6 metres in length. But where are you going to find the extra space? Well, let's have a look. Firstly, the minimum distance behind the new 2005 spec headlamp tester has been changed to 600 millimetres, allowing for the hoist to move slightly further back. We can then install our new 4.6 metre hoist, fitted with turning plates and wheel play detectors. As the hoist is going to be the headlamp aim standing area, the position of the wheel play detectors may need to be given additional consideration if they don't comply with the plus or minus 6 millimetre level requirement. We can now position the roller brake tester in relation to the hoist and this dimension has been significantly reduced. The minimum distance from the edge of the roller brake tester to the hoist recess must now be a minimum of 600 millimetres. Finally, the distance from the other edge of the roller brake tester to the entrance doors must be at least 1.5 metres. The rest of the roller brake tester standing area is permitted to be outside of the building, but in all cases the first 3.35 metres from either side of the roller brake tester centre line must be substantially level. So in this example, we've managed to install an ATL bay with a longer hoist in a nominal overall length of nine metres. That's right. Now, under the previous requirements to fit this kind of equipment, we would have needed a test bay of something like 12 metres in length. So hopefully these changes will benefit a considerable number of VTSs that wish to upgrade. Jake, I understand that the distance from the edge of the hoist to the wall has now increased from 500 millimetres to 600 millimetres. Is that going to cause a problem? It shouldn't do, because there'll be lots of options. The diagram of the old test bay showed a four-post hoist, whereas the new hoist has no posts visible on the plan view. This is because it depicts a scissor-type lift or a two-post lift. So are there any other types of bay layout that might benefit from these changes? Yeah, absolutely. The, the, the example we've seen here could easily be adapted for a test bay with a pit rather than a hoist or even a drive-through layout. But in the case of a pit, would you need to extend it? Not if the pit already has a minimum working length of 3.9 metres. So that would save a lot of extra building work. But what if you've got a testing station that has a roller brake tester in an adjacent bay rather than in line? Well, this bay isn't quite so common, but let's have a look at an example anyway. Now here we have a side-by-side -side layout in a test bay with a nominal overall length and width that are both 7.2 metres. Now to upgrade to ATL 
or OPTL under the previous requirements, the test bay length would have needed to be increased to at least 9 metres to incorporate the roller brake tester standing area. However, under the new requirements, and by moving the headlamp aim tester into the roller brake tester standing area, upgrading to ATL can be achieved without having to extend the building. So it certainly appears that the changes will allow quite a number of testing stations to upgrade to one-person testing. But you mentioned a bit earlier, Jake, about Class 4 testing stations adding a motorcycle test bay. Tell us more about that. Particularly because some of the newer roller brake testers are authorised to test motorcycles as well. Now they use an adapter plate to narrow the available roller area and they also weigh the machine and test. You'd still need a separate area, though, would you, to carry out the inspection? Yeah, you would. Uh, I've actually got an example of such a layout on here. Now here we see the same side-by-side -side layout that we looked at in the previous example. The AE has decided not only to upgrade to ATL, but also to add a motorcycle test bay. Now to facilitate this, the headlamp aim tester and roller brake tester have been repositioned so that the headlamp aim standing area straddles the roller brake tester. The motorcycle inspection area has been marked out so that it falls either side of the headlamp aim tester. Additionally, a removable motorcycle brake test adapter plate must be fitted to the roller brake tester when carrying out a motorcycle test. So is that all the equipment they need for motorcycle testing? Mm, not quite. They'll also need sufficient jacks or stands to raise the wheels of motorcycles that don't benefit from having a centre stand. They'll also need a couple of straight edges or cords so they're able to check wheel alignment. So not a huge capital outlay then to add a motorcycle test facility as long as you're incorporating it into an ATL upgrade? Well that's right, adding a motorcycle facility won't be possible for all garage layouts but for whatever class or classes of vehicle you do test there will be a variety of options available. So regardless of whether the testing station has a pit or a hoist or a plate brake tester mm -hmm. or a roller brake tester? Yeah, well, the AE should utilise a layout that makes the best use of the space he's got available. And we can employ the services of, uh, of the many um, advisory, professional advisory bodies out there, or even the, the equipment manufacturers themselves will give advice. And Jake, you haven't mentioned yet whether there are any changes in regard to the height of test stations. No, in general, the headroom requirements haven't changed, although over a lift, the uh, headroom dimensions have been simplified, so it makes it much easier to understand. And what about the entrance and exit dimensions? Well, there's no change for class four, but for class seven, the minimum doorway width requirements have been reduced from three and a half meters to three meters, unless the doorway actually forms part of the uh, roller brake tester standing area. And what about class three testing stations? Well, currently all class three testing stations also test class four, so there'll be no re real need to look at these requirements. And will the changes make it easier for Class 4 testing stations to take on Class 7 testing? Well, it could be possible for some of the larger Class 4 testing stations that couldn't previously meet the requirements may now be able to do so. Um, however, it's more likely that um, existing Class 7 stations will be able to now in future test Class 4. Because they're all bigger than Class 4 testing stations anyway? Well, that's true. But the stumbling block has always been that a Class 7 testing station was always allowed to have some of the brake test standing area actually outside the building. Now with Class 4 that was never allowed because it all had to be under cover. So that's the change here now that can be outside? Some of it can be, yes. So is there anything else that an AE might want to consider? Well there is, yeah. Um, what an AE needs to remember here is that the published dimensions are the, uh, the minimum requirements. So if at some point an AE wants to be able to test larger vehicles within his test class, say like pickups or crew cab type of vehicles which are very popular now, he, he'll have to factor these requirements into his, his, his dimensions when he's initially designing his test facility. Because they may just be too long for a minimum length hoist. Yeah, exactly. Some of these vehicles can exceed five metres in length. So um, the AE would have to consider the, the potential increase in, in, in any business or you know potential business that, that may come from this. But when they're selecting uh, what size pit they need or whatever hoist they're going to use. OK, so if an AE likes the sound of all this and they think, yes, I want to upgrade my facilities to an ATL or an OPTL or add an extra test class, what should be their first move? OK, well, the first thing they need to do is get informed and they can find all the information they need on the Business Link website. And the requirements for authorisation for all classes are there? They are. And you'll also find some useful diagrams to help illustrate the relevant dimensions. 
Jake, mm. if, um, if an AE decides upgrading is a possibility, can they just sort of crack on and start installing new equipment? No, no, certainly not. They shouldn't start to install any equipment or make any alterations whatsoever until they've notified VOSA and, and obtained approval in principle. That way they can avoid some very expensive mistakes. Well, that makes sense. How do I go about doing that? Well, firstly, we need to get some plans drawn up showing the intended test bay layout. And it just so happens I've got a, a okay. set of plans here for us to look at. They look pretty detailed. This one has a bay for all classes. Does, mm -hmm. Do they need to be quite that detailed? No, they don't. The plan needs to be a fully dimensioned drawing of the proposed MOT testing bay showing the location of the test equipment and the area from which the test may be observed. Hopefully you'll already have a separate site plan from when the VTS was previously authorised, which shows the location of the premises, the test bay, access and parking. So, would I need an architect to prepare those plans for me? No, not necessarily. If you're buying new equipment, you'll find that many of the uh, equipment suppliers will offer the plans as part of the package anyway. Or alternatively, you can do it yourself and save a few bob in the process. So do my plans have to be to scale, though? No, they don't. As long as all the, the test equipment is fully identified and the, the, the plans are fully dimensioned, that should be okay. OK, and once I've got my plans, I guess I need to fill in one of my, those uh, VT1 forms that we spoke about a little earlier. That's right. Download one of those from the Business Link website, fill in the appropriate sections and then post it off to your local VOSA office. And so I send that off and if they like the plans, they'll give me approval in principle? Yeah, they might do, but bear in mind they might also want to send a vehicle examiner along with a tape measure just to check a few dimensions. Well, Jake, from what you've been telling me, it sounds like these new requirements could be pretty good news for quite a few test stations out there. Yeah, happy days. You know, we've been listening to the trade and hopefully the changes that we've made here will be of benefit to many.